Good day, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining today's special edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York City. On December the 20th, Taneo issued its Vision 2023 CEO and Investor Outlook Survey. As we head into the new year, corporate leaders and institutional investors alike are navigating an uncertain economic and operational landscape. And at the same time, they are in the early stages of a paradigm shipping, a shaping period. Um, the American-led system of globalization, uneven and challenging rise of China, energy transition and the imperatives of climate change and sustainability, the societal disruptions of technological innovation, indeed the role of the corporation itself in the 21st century, all of these things are in flux now. Against this backdrop, Taneo's in-house data, insights and analytics team conducted this survey of some 300 corporate uh, CEOs, global CEOs and institutional investors representing some $3 trillion of company and portfolio value. So here today to discuss the survey's findings and to offer their own insights, I'm joined by Taneo's leadership. Paul Keary is Taneo's CEO uh, and one of the firm's founders, and he's uh, a longtime advisor uh, to, um, to C-suites and, uh, and boards alike on strategy and communications. Ursula Burns, who's been on this program many times, is the chairwoman of Taneo, and earlier a long-term client, first as CEO and chair of Xerox, and later as the chair of the international telecom services company, Beyond. She is on the boards currently of ExxonMobil, Uber, and the Endeavor Group, uh, as well as a number of private company and institutional boards. So thank you both for, for joining uh, me today. And, We'll dive into the details here in a, in a moment, but Paul, I want to start start with you um, at the highest level here and kind of get your your key takeaways um, from this survey and importantly, anything that that surprised you um, uh, from what the respondents had to say. Thanks, Kevin. A um, couple of things by way perhaps of opening answer to that. One is why did we survey the concerns and issues of both CEOs and investors. I think we all felt it was important to talk to the executive branch and also talk to the ownership branch. There is a world of data out there about macroeconomic disruptive issues. I think it's always interesting to look at those that seek to run those businesses and those that seek to invest in those companies and understand is there a delta. And indeed there has been some interesting findings from the survey, which I think drew my eye originally. One is, um, I think, the difference of opinion as to the likelihood of worsening economic conditions in the first half of next year. It's stark, to say the least, that almost three quarters of surveyed global public company CEOs from large and mid -com mid sized companies all felt that they're looking at a 2023, the first half at least, of worsening economic conditions albeit the U.S. Uh, CEO set are a little less bearish than their Asian and European counterparts. Uh, but by and large, there's a sense there's going to be worsening economic conditions. Perhaps no surprise there, Kevin and Ursula, from what we've all seen and read. However, the delta between that and the investor view is significant in the sense that majority of investors don't think that there's going to be a worsening economic condition in the first half and indeed opportunities for improvement. And I think it's worth unpacking that today, perhaps, as some of our conversation. I think the second point that jumped out at me is something that um, we've all, again, engaged on the topic, read about the topic, advised our clients on the topic, but it's becoming, to me, uh, a key issue for 23 and beyond, which is deglobalization and moving from a bumper sticker, perhaps, to a real operational priority. Uh, most of our clients had the benefit of globalization for the last 30 years, improved supply chain efficiency, improved capital market efficiency, improved access to the world's consumers. And in a deglobalized world, um, there's obviously likely consequences that will be about, again, access to consumer markets, access to supply chains, access to capital markets. And also, I think Kevin and uh, Ursula and I are keen to unpack that one too, because there's lots of anecdotal and I think statistical information to talk through, that's maybe one of the big challenges for 23 and beyond. I think they're the two primary points that jumped out and grabbed me. Yeah, I think you've just uh, 
set the agenda for this call. But before we dive into those into those details, Ursula, maybe I can turn to you and ask you the same same question of what really jumped out to you, uh, made what made sense, what surprised you. But maybe also you could refract then through the lens then of your own, you know, how you would have responded in a sense, having sat in that in that Fortune 100 CEO seat yourself. Yeah, I would agree with Paul. And thank you, Kevin, uh, for opening this and hosting this. Thank you for Paul, Paul for partnering. I would agree with Paul on the two that he mentioned. One is this economic outlook disparity uh, from CEOs to investors. Even though when you go below it, which we'll do today, it probably is easier to understand if you think about it from the perspective of both of those, the, the, those two parties. The second point of globalization or deglobalization is absolutely a um, it's a point that every business leader, every investor, um, even customers are really focused on because we have built fundamental capitalism on globalization over the last 35 or 40 years. And this is a fundamental shift that most of the CEOs in seat today all of the CEOs in the seat today probably have not lived through a deglobalized world before. They've only lived in this open, freer market environment, and we have to keep an eye on on the, the, the business leaders and their businesses to make sure that they're adjusting appropriately to this new reality. The third I would add is the point that came out in the survey about innovation. And this survey was taken, if you, just to let you know, before the collapse of FTX. So this was before um, all of the cryptocurrency, you know, um, shine that we have today or de-shine. And the difference between CEOs thinking about um, how innovation will impact them or how how they will use it and investors is pretty interesting. CEOs fairly cautious about the newer technologies, you know, the metaverse, um, you know, cryptocurrencies and on and on. And investors are a little bit more interested in CEOs actually being more interested in that and actually using it more. And I think that that's an interesting place where there should be more alignment, but there isn't. Um, there seems to be a little bit of divergence there. Those are the three areas. So Paul, let's let's go back to that macroeconomic point at the very beginning, because it really sets the stage for this report. And, um, and it starts the report off with a bit of a bang because of that disparity. So as you pointed out, um, 83% uh, of the large company CEOs thought that the global economy would worsen in the first half of this year, and 72% uh, of investors and 89% of the, the middle-sized middle company CEOs thought that the economy would improve. improve. How do you explain that disparity? And I know that when we're talking about the economy, oftentimes investors are looking at it writ large, Corporate CEOs might looking might be looking at it in a more narrow, what does it mean for me, my company, my industry, but how do you reconcile those two outlooks? I think to, to, to those that are sitting in the, the C-suite, I think you're facing a set of significant unknowns that's just really hard for your team to model. Despite the fact that they've wrestled with some of these new unknowns over the last couple of years, the market is presenting new ones. So I think if you're looking to understand customer demand next year, you're constrained by, I think, maybe a lack of clarity on Fed, regulatory or legislative policy or the impacts on policy. I think it's really hard to model customer demand and the health of the family balance sheet. I think it's hard to understand the likely impacts of uh, Fed policies that I referenced previously. And I think you've got a series of new disruptive factors from technology and you know, the, the deep crypto winter that we're all facing, shifts in political leadership around the world, and you know, representation, uh, this, this study shows that deglobalization is going to impact bottom line for companies in the short to medium term. So I think if you're a CEO and you're facing today's unknowns and you're trying to model out the likely unknowns of next year, it is hard to be anything other than conservative on how you are going to win in this, in this next financial period. From an investor perspective, my, my guess would be that um, maybe investors are motivated by thinking that a lot of the bad news is already priced in. I think that uh, 
perhaps a view that the Fed can cool the economy enough, at least to lower inflation. And I think if you looked at the five-year average on a forward PE um, ratio, you're looking at equities looking a little bit like good value currently. So I think there is not a lot of contradiction in the reality. I think the fact is investors are looking at value. They're looking at perhaps the downside being largely protected. And CEOs are looking at the macro, micro, internal externalities about how you bring a product or service to the market and what might be the friction points to that. And as a consequence, I think, you know, maybe if you polled investors in three months' time with more clarifying data, um, you may get a different view. But I don't think you'll get a different view from CEOs in three months because some of the headwinds and tailwinds that they're wrestling with are likely to be medium-term in nature rather than anything short-term. So, Ursula, I mean, one of the one of the contradictions that's sort of in, implicit in what Paul just talked about. I mean, if we're talking about CEOs and leaders essentially going through an unprecedented moment as we kind of as, as we kind of transition from the globalization system writ large that we have all operated under for the last you know 50 years into something else, it's hard to say that the market is accurately discounting anything because we don't know actually what it is that we're we're going into in the longer term. But to Paul's point on this difference between managers on the one hand and owners on the um, and, and, and owners on the other, it's easy to see that the street might be a little bit more optimistic just in the last you know news cycle of last week where you know the, the headline was perhaps inflation has peaked, uh, the rate of uh, the rate of Fed hikes is going to um, is going to moderate. Uh, moderate somewhere, somewhat so the street may see that they've got more clarity on what's to what's to come. However, the challenges that Paul just talked about exist um, and will persist for for corporate management. But this allocation then of ever more scarce and more expensive capital, there's going to be this difference between how the street wants to employ that and how management will actually be able to do so. So, how do you see that kind of that that tension? Between owners uh, of capital and the deployers of it, um, you know, uh, playing out when there is that sort of difference in 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 outlook. Yeah, I actually believe that this is not the first time. I think that this happens often, but in smaller chunks and for smaller sectors of the business economy for that side. But I think that right right now the the it's happening across the board because there are so many different um impacts so many different issues weighing on a ceo if they could actually narrow their focus to globalization or to a lower economic outlook or to innovation or to their employees or to whatever it was alone um or even in buckets of two or three i think that there would be a little bit of a different um feeling um from the from the business leaders but i think right now at least what i'm sensing with the with the ceos that i work with more often is that there are there is a lot coming at them there's a lot of different vectors and paul mentioned this inability to actually um see beyond the relatively short term it's one of the things that came out in the survey that was inf interesting was this um, response that was about lack of information being a, a relatively impactful thing to them. Think about that answer to a question. The ability to see clearly or to see even a little bit unclearly, literally three or four months from now, is very difficult for business leaders. So they are particularly large company CEOs who have largely globalized, who have largely um, invested with land building and equipment across the world, they are seeing this pullback, the lack of globalization, the deglobalization, the voice of their employees, the increased low access to capital, et cetera, et cetera, the sentiment changes, all of these things, they're seeing them as a massive headwind at one time. I think that one of the things that we can't overlook from the survey is not, we have to look at all of the issues together not any issue specifically. And all of the issues together makes the, makes the top three issues, I think, unbelievably um, impactful and concerning to business leaders in the street. And I, won't, I would not um, underrate this whole idea about pricing things in. You know, the market looks forward 
CEOs look forward as well, but they operate on today and the next quarter more often than not. And that is definitely cloudy. And if you look at the difference between like US CEOs and non-US CEOs, you see that stark difference for sure. In the Europe in European and Asian CEOs, they see a little bit more, they are more downtrodden than the US CEOs because they have a significantly heavier burden from the economy, from the war, from the so on and so on and so on. And that you see that in the CEO's sentiment as well. Yeah, that stands, stands to reason. It seems that uh, obviously the Fed is in is at the front at the forefront of global central banks. Um, it looks like the recession, if there even is a recession in the United States, will be shallower than what we're going to see perhaps in exactly. uh, in, in Europe. Um, and so we're recovering. And, fr and quite frankly, you know, after the last several years, also the United States looks like it's back in a leading position in how it's reacting to the war, in how it's reacting to a global economic downturn, um, uh, et cetera. So, you know, both of you at the uh, at the outset, you pointed out the deglobalization point um, uh, or section in this report. And I'm going to tie that also into the disruption uh, disruption section. So let's pause on that for a minute here, uh, because it really was one of the most interesting um, findings in the uh, in the report. Both big majorities of CEOs and investors alike um, say that this phenomenon is a is a reality and is essentially unfolding um, now. They're a little bit more split on how significant it, that will be, and I, I'm, I'm interested to know your thoughts on this. But but before we even unpack all of that, it's worth defining what deglobalization even means, right? You could define that very narrowly uh, as a CEO. Deglobalization can mean, well, I'm going to reshore my supply chains. That's essentially deglobalizing. Um, but you could also look at it very, very widely by defining globalization as not just um, trade routes, but essentially, you know, that is the operating system that we have been under that allowed for, you know, the global labor rate differentials, global economies of scale, global just-in-time supply chain, global free, you know, free exchange of capital and people. All of that essentially allowed you to maximize uh, maximize profit by by lowering costs. Uh, absolutely. So this question of what deglobalization means and how people are responding to it, how do you define that in the first place, Paul? Yeah, I think there's um, you know, the survey is instructive. Also, you know, the hundreds of conversations we have every week with CEOs or those that lead from the regulatory legislative. A perspective as well. Um, I think globalization has broadly been defined as with the big geopolitical shifts that companies are going to be subject to and the big supply chain shifts that companies have to adapt to. Uh, everything else from my perspective is noise. But if you're sitting on a, you know, many of the CEOs of today's companies were in some executive function uh, over the last 30 years. Many were just entering the workforce. But those businesses have benefited from globalization for three decades. And at its, at its peak, at its most efficient, it drove prices down and proved returns. Um, so I think we're entering into that reality post-COVID, and as we enter a new geopolitical paradigm, I think framed by US-China relations, uh, then you've got some additional pressure on the CEO suite to rethink and understand and prepare for this deglobalized reality. I think one of the things that's interesting from the report, however, is that investors uh, are looking for more active uh, adaptations in this reality. And both cohorts, investors and CEOs understand, are recognizing and are thinking through deglobalization. Investors are looking for some more, I think, swifter um, adaptions as a consequence. And that's from adjusting supply chain routes to you know, looking at M&A to how do you offshore, onshore differently? Um, and what are the new sources of funding? And fundamentally, which is really going to be a concern across all companies that have an ambition or a current operation in China, is to rethink the model as to what does a reduced China market opportunity mean? Um, and I think that is the cause du jour, but it's also going to be the cause du jour for perhaps a generation as a consequence. We're in a very interesting and historic moment right now from an economic perspective and a geopolitical perspective, and I think from a boardroom perspective. And this survey, I think, starts to dig in a little bit into where is that 
executive branch and the ownership branch. Uh, they're aligned on the reality. They're aligned on the importance. <clears throat> they're getting aligned, perhaps on the key issues that companies need to, to attend to, with investors sensing the urgency of this impending deglobalization or putting pressure on the executive branch to make some changes. And that, to me, is going to be you know, an issue that has received relatively, I would say, medium to low levels of attention, broadly speaking. I think there's a broad awareness of supply chain, broad awareness of geopolitical tumult. Uh, there's a deep awareness of an economic contraction. But I think you can put a fine point on some of the C-suite concerns for next year, and you can call it deglobalization. And I think a lot of things, as you rightly pointed out, Kevin, hang on that. Definition of the word is important. And I think for our clients, it's geopolitical, uh, framed by US China, and the need to be more adaptive on supply chain post COVID. So Ursula, Paul has net said a, non, a number of times so far today, this kind of, this difference in the speed um, uh, imperative that investors see versus what the CEOs, but the investors kind of want the companies to, to move a little faster. But when you put yourself back in the, in the CEO uh, seat that you occupied, I mean, the street can always uh, be more nimble in a sense, right? I don't think you're doing enough with your uh, you know, efficient capital deployment. I can divest from you and, and move my capital over here. Whereas you have to live with the decisions that you've made, particularly if that means you know, capital investment somewhere. So uh, it, how do you, you know, that, that tension um, is, is in a way always been irreconcilable, but is becoming even more fraught now because these decisions are going to be so consequential. Um, given the uncertainties that Paul just talked about, you know, geopolitical and, and, and others of which companies actually have a lot less control over that environment than they do over other elements that have perhaps been uh, uh, bigger variables in the past. This is one of the areas where Paul and I speak about this a lot. We speak about this with CEOs a lot as well. This is a time when communication actually is valuable, um, we're meaning communic investors to business leaders and so business owners to business leaders, business owners and leaders to government. Um, this, uh, this is a time when it's actually worthwhile to talk to each other. Unfortunately, we are more likely to not do that. We've kind of encamped into our very different worlds. Um, but yes, it's, it, is, it is a challenge. The pace that you can make, that you, first of all, the decision-making speed is relative, is slower in business than it is in in, um, in, that, in the investing world, that's one. And then once you make a decision, the ability to implement, just talk about reshift, about shifting your supply chain, about moving away from a, a 1.4 billion person market, um, about the access to talent, for example, about that being used more in home of nations than being exported around the world. All of that doesn't lend itself to quick moves. They don't lend themselves to, well, I'll do something in the quarter and I'll change my mind in the next quarter. It actually, it, most companies operate in such a manner, manner from the past that, that that swift move is almost impossible. So there is this tension between you should be moving faster and the ability to move fast, not only between the, the various groups, but inside the group as well. They know that they should be moving faster, but it's really un it's not easy to unwind some of these decisions. And that's one of the things that the pandemic and the supply chain um, inflexibility, but efficiency, right? Inflexible, but efficient supply chain that we had in the past. What we learned is that that efficiency came at a cost of flexibility. So we're gonna have to rebuild our approach to that whole um, piece of the capitalist system, right? So from the, from the Western side, we have to actually be shorter a little we have to judge efficiency and measure efficiency very differently than we did before we have to measure and judge effectiveness very differently than we did before it's not just dollars it's responsiveness it's flexibility you know it's protection it's not only in dollars it's not in only movement of goods and and people it is people it is the access to technology it's about opening and closing markets so it's a it's an interesting time for ceos they're very interesting time for business leaders so I don't want to digress too much, but I do want to uh, follow up, if I may, on something you just said, which is that given all of these uncertainties, that it's ever more critical for all of the stakeholders to be communicating here. And you highlighted 
you know, investors and the corporate leadership class on the one side and policymakers and regulators on the other. And yet, given that, um, it feels like the, the separation between Washington and corporate America is as great as it has ever been in many ways. Um, you know, traditionally, obviously, the Republican Party had been seen as the party of big business. Now that isn't, can't be taken for, for granted anymore. I know talking to international business leaders as I've been outside the U.S. and, and talking to people in, in Asia, China in particular, doesn't can't recognize this system that is sort of emerging in the United States now. It's becoming harder for them to, to, to navigate as a, um, as a result. How do we get that, the, you know, those interests more aligned? Again, obviously, the Biden administration through the, uh, the, the, the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and so on and so forth, there's an, there's an element of, of, of sort of, um, uh, you know, industrial policy that's coming back in, and yet there's no quarter for CEOs in Washington right now. Basically, both sides kind of want to bring them in front of committees and, you know, and, and question them on everything right now. So how do we reconcile that in an efficient way um, that will, you know, bolster the competitiveness um, of corporate America? You know, I think this is one where um, Taneo does quite a bit of work here thinking about, but also trying to um, barter between groups, conversation, discussion, understanding and clarity about um, what each side does. This sounds so basic and so fundamental, what I'm about ready to say, but it is something that we have not practiced for quite a few administrations, for many and many administrations. Republican or Democratic, where we start to understand more and more, and the rise of China and the pandemic made this more made us more aware of this. And I hope it's the beginning of a change where we know that we have to work together um, more tightly, not um, against anyone or any policy, but trying to take our roles and understand um, what they are and actually. Um, use them to, for the good of the nation and the good of the global economy, particularly Western global economy, which is where the focus is here. Right now, we don't have that practice in place, but we are starting to practice more and more interactions and engagements and discussions. And I think both the CHIP Act and the Inflation Reduction Act were both examples of a little bit of conversation ending up, a little bit of conversation, <laughs> ending up to be a good set of political and policy outcomes. We have to continue to do that. We are, we cannot win by, win in the global economic race by having our resources focused internally against each other. We, I think that we are very clear about that now. And we have to actually continue to practice um, as difficult as it is to stay out of the limelight and remove policy, political, the political mess from it. We have to actually continue to focus on doing that just that and ceos are trying to do that speaking to both sides of the aisle talking about policy talking about um what a particular approach to labor markets or um treasury treasury actions what that approach would have on their business it's more and more important that those conversations continue paul one of the things that really did perplex me in this section of the report though was the question of how important China is going to be to your, meaning the respondents, business um, going forward. Um, and it was a, uh, a sort of a strikingly low number um, of, of CEOs. And I understand that the question was posed in such a way as that how you know, is China going to be very important as opposed to just sort of important plus, but uh, so maybe not as all encompassing as the question could have been, but how do you interpret it? I mean, was that, Surprising to you um, uh, as well? Um, not as surprising in light of, I think, our collective conversations across clients, uh, across boardrooms, and across you know, time zones. There is a growing realization that the geopolitical framing of the West relationship with China and US relationship with China and the political ramifications of that geopolitical um, relationship are going to end up with businesses being the net loser. Uh, not because I think policies are being framed for that purpose, but when you have geopolitical tension uh, and when you have in the US an impending 
election cycle leading up to a presidential election where there's a probability that all politicians will be scrambling to be more hawkish than the other in relation to their stance on China. Businesses are the net losers in that paradigm. As a consequence, I think the realization among lots of companies across multiple sectors is China is a market that is going to be hard to depend on for access to consumers, funding, and expansion opportunities, and I think supply chain resilience. And that realization, I think, is impacting their confidence on the import of China to their business moving forward, despite the obvious size and strength and scale and importance of that consumer cohort. I think that the externalities, which are not driven to punish or reward businesses, but the consequences will be potentially punishing as we go through a, um, a political cycle in the US and other markets. So I think, I think that's what's driving some of that realization at the C-suite. And do you think then, I mean, is, is implicit in that a notion of, uh, of, de of de-risking? And I ask that question because do you actually think that it's more about re-risking in a sense? I mean, I recall being in a, uh, at a conference a few years ago uh, that was only, ha only had CEOs in it. And the question was asked, you know, how many of you CEOs have been to China in the last 12 months? And every single CEO in the room raised their hand. Obviously, this was pre-pandemic, right? Every CEO in the, in the room raised their hand. And then they asked the follow-up question, how many of you have been to Vietnam in the last 12 months? And only one uh, raised, their, uh, raised their hand. And my point is, is that as supply chains move somewhat out of, uh, of China, and I think it's obviously premature to say that it, it's happening at a wholesale level, we can disaggregate this, we can see that there are certain companies and industries like the auto industry and say Apple computer that, that are in no way um, really able to, to move out of China at all fast. And as, and as Ursula points out, you come up against that brick wall of 1.4 billion consumers that has to be factored into your, uh, into your calculations and the messaging that you want to be giving to China at the same time. But my point is, is that whatever you move out of China is not going to be equally redistributed around the world. There are going to be certain attractive, in theory, destinations. It could be Vietnam. It could be Hungary. It could be northern Mexico. Um, and yet, if you concentrate supply chains in those places, you're creating a whole new and unanticipated set of political and logistical risks um, uh, as well that you perhaps haven't invested as much time in understanding as you have in, 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 in China. So are we really just talking about re-risking as opposed to de-risking? I would Paul. say that... First of all, go ahead, please. Uh, let me start. I think that it is a bit of re-risking, um, but... We had an all in, many companies have a, it's a big basket and we're all in that basket. A lot of our um, investments from a policy perspective, internal to company policy, policy perspective, from a supply chain perspective, from a just how we compete and partner perspective was focused in this one country, albeit a big one. and you do open up a different approach, a different kind of risk on the, when you go to Vietnam or Taiwan, which is not as easy to go to now when you, when you are concerned about its, its uh, cousin being under stress. So I, it is re-risking, but I think it's, it's easier to do that. It's easier to live in that world. The risks are, are distributed in that world versus the world that we currently are in where we have one large, um, bolus to kind of move around. So it is different risk. It is uh, both are risky, but I think the China, the China situation is one that companies have to really look at deeply because the impact is so significant. One seems like coordinated um, country that can have such a massive impact on just about every industry out there. So even though we're not say all, not all CEOs are saying it, all CEOs have to live it that they have to have a policy that bakes in the fact that they have to de-risk any future growth and future investment in China. They have to de-risk that by going to, going to neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think anyone is willing yet um, on, a, on, the, on the company side to walk away. I think many of the CEOs are still kind of holding back, but not severing uh, the news, one, because they don't know how, but others because they are hopeful that there may be some, some detente 
that we can still put, that the businesses can still participate in this very large market. So Ursula, you I know. Would, uh, I would yeah, add sorry. one point to that, Kevin. So in sure. relation to the risk to risk, I think it's, I actually think it is a fundamental sort of reshift which businesses are adapting to rather than understanding the risk or de-risk opportunities, which has been, I think, the model for the last 30 years. What I mean by that is China-US relations are at a pivotal point. It's not just about territorial or sovereign disputes. It's about who, has, who controls access to critical minerals and critical technologies, which is then translating into an existential uh, set of models at, I think, a sovereign level between those two nations. And businesses are where they were formerly for the last 30 years in the driving seat about shaping and understanding and playing a central role to trade policies. They're going to be subject to geopolitical shift as a consequence of the issue of primacy. And so from that perspective, I think businesses need to understand that they will need to you know, strap in and understand these externalities that are driving market access or lack of market access. I think be ahead of how those geopolitical models are likely to roll out and think through what it what it means for each of those sovereign nations to win as it pertains to control of or control of access to critical minerals and critical technologies. That's the larger theater and I think businesses that understand that theater is going to have primacy are more likely to win or reduce the aspect of their losses in this next period. So having said that, I mean, however you define, however you plan for, and however you execute in a, in a deglobalizing world, it's going to cost a lot of money, right? About individually and at an aggregate uh, level in a world where there's going to be less free money and, and less abundant capital. And though the pandemic and the war uh, both you know, illustrated just how fragile a just-in-time global supply chain actually is, um, the other hallmark uh, of that of that globalized world, of course, was low cost, meaning higher profitability. So, in the midst of all of this, then the risk is for for disruption of these finely laid plans that everybody is going to be making um, uh, making going forward. But you know, following COVID and the Russian invasion, very high numbers of corporate and investment leaders are still saying that there are bottlenecks, you know, within their companies that slow their ability to respond to these, whatever you want to call them, black swan events or fat tail risks uh, that, that seem to be happening with much greater frequency than models would normally suggest, right? And we know that we've got things like China, Taiwan on the horizon, trade issue, control, as Paul just said, over the critical minerals and, and metals and elements of the energy transition. All of these things are going to be in play. So Ursula, you know, you, you, were, you were in that seat at a Fortune 100. Why is, why are these bottlenecks still so deeply institutionalized after you've had these series of things show you how you've got to be more nimble and you've got to have a better understanding um, and be more forward looking. How is that, how are they not responding to that? Oh, I just, I think, that, I think, Kevin, you and I spoke about this at some other point. I think, Paul, you were in it. It's not that they're not responding. I, I have a lot of confidence, interestingly enough, a lot more confidence in this area that the businesses are actually trying to respond. And we talked about this earlier. It's responding to something that has been built over 30 years. It's, re it's responding to a set of experiences that have happened in these CEOs' lives over 10 years or 15 years. So, but the change that's happening is pretty immediate. I mean, the war, the pandemic, the rise of China, not immediate, but um, definitely accelerated. Those changes and the response time are definitely um, mispositioned. You know what I mean? They are definitely mispositioned. But I don't believe that that businesses are sitting back and not responding. I think that they are trying hard um, to to adjust. But I, it's just going to take time, particularly when we're talking about the scale that we're talking about. If you think about the scale of building a supply chain from here to anywhere else in the world, from the United States to anywhere else in the world, and go farther away, go to China, go to Asia. That has taken years and years and years to build in an efficient way. And it's gonna take years, not years and years and years, it's gonna take years to um, 
unwind and adjust into different spaces. The receivers have to be ready. The senders have to be ready. Government has to help and be ready to actually re rearticulate rules of the road for all of the players in in this on this field. I don't, but I don't believe that we're sitting back. And all the and CEOs that I speak to, which we speak to a lot, and the businesses that I'm on the boards are, they are spending quite a bit of time on about uh, just about all the issues in this survey. It's just that the response of the ability to respond very quickly is is very low. And the the and I say this a lot. The the fact that all of this is happening like yesterday, right? We have a pandemic, we have a war, China is getting large, we have these current, these uh, new technologies that are coming. Employees are having voices that we've never heard of before. ESG is now measured. Let's keep talking and talking and talking. All of this lands on the on the desk of the CEO on Monday. <laughs> and he has to he or she has to deal with all of them on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, all of them. And that's where I think there's a there's a huge adjustment that we're going to have to make. And Paul said it a little bit when he talked about profit pools being being lower. That I I, I foresee that for sure. I think it's very it's going to be difficult to make this transition without, on average, um, capital markets, particularly Western capital markets, actually, and companies on that side, um, having less less. Um, cash and profits uh, to kind of throw around. It's it's going to cost money and take time. Yeah, I think the the, the point you're making is a, is a is a really interesting one that the the system of globalization wasn't some sort of brand design that 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 got us to exactly where we were uh, right before the pandemic and, and and the war. It was a set of philosophies and incentives that ultimately gave rise to this highly efficient, um, well, it was efficient as long as everything worked perfectly uh, system. But the difference yeah. is, is like, A, now you're talking about all of this has to change in a very, very in, in, re relatively a compact period of time, but more importantly, perhaps, the, the scorecard is instantaneous with global markets, global information Absolutely. transference, social media, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, a, and a more diverse set of stakeholders that are gonna weigh in on, on those choices that are being made. But Paul, you made this point, that a lot of, you know, of what both you and Ursula have been talking about can come back down to, to geopolitics um, and a changing geoeconomic um, uh, system, as well as sort of the imperatives from climate change and other, and other pressures, societal pressures, demographic pressures, all things that the company has uh, very little influence, um, influence over. And so therefore, understanding those variables don't, you know, aren't, aren't reliant on the traditional, traditional competencies within a company. So how are you then advising and recommending the C-suites and to the boards and to investors alike, how they ought to better get a grip on these things so that they're making better, more informed, more efficient and rational decisions going forward in this uncertain space? I think there's, a, you know, the issues that, that they face the CEO, the CFO, the GC, the CCO are reputational, they're financial, they're operational, they're transformational, all at the same time. And it, it has always been so. Um, pace is a Moore's law, perhaps application on the pace of disruption. Um, so the level of tumult, the level of disruption, I think changes generation to generation and perhaps year over year. I think the primary difference for 23 and beyond for companies versus even the last period is I think there's a resizing of perhaps the broad consumer customer base as a consequence of deglobalization. How do you win an environment where perhaps your pool of consumers has, has shifted? I think it's about being first to embrace some of the technologies that are driving disruption, whether that's across new digital finance, both rails and currencies, across new technologies that improve both the efficacy of how a company does its work, but also the efficacy of how it accesses markets, and realization of what the metaverse and Web 3.0 is going to mean for companies. So markets lost in a worst case scenario in a deglobalized world would have to be counterbalanced with share one in the overall total addressable market that will shift. Um, and companies have always been the leading indicators at how best to navigate these times. 
Um, CEOs, I think, move faster than governments. Um, boards support those CEOs and executive teams. So I would be looking towards the CEO class of 23 to understand how we navigate through this period because they've largely been the leading indicators as to on innovation and embrace of geopolitical and external issues and concerns. So I think those companies and CEOs that understand globalization first and deglobalization, and those that understand the disruptive technologies and their either efficacy for their business or the TAM expansion opportunity for their businesses were the ones that win. And I think it seems you know, obvious to aggregate it as so, but I think they're, the chat, Ursa made a very interesting point, which is you know, Monday morning, his or her, you know, and probably Sunday night and Saturday as well, CEO's role um, is about how do you chart a path through that. So I think charting a path through that means being abrasive of the technologies and first to understand the consequences of some of those geopolitical shifts. So this is a perfect segue into kind of where there's this clash between two of the uh, subsequent sections in this report, innovation on the one hand and people on the other, right? So uh, you make this point, Paul, that, you know, that, uh, that being first to embrace um, and, being, and leaning in on some of these critical technologies that are going to be differentiators in the 21st century. Um, and then we see some interesting findings in the people section of the, of the report about, you know, how CEOs perceive you know the generational leadership in their in their organizations, and that they're that they need more of that kind of younger um, uh, cohort that that un, that understands uh, or is quicker to embrace some of these technologies. And you can see that the investor class is also wanting them to be more aggressive. But in but considering that the CEO is dealing currently with all the dislocations of the here and now, in addition to trying to make rational decisions going forward that they're not going to get penalized for for later you can see again this this disconnect ursula you made the point at the very beginning that the survey was taken prior to the collapse of ftx and one of the interesting takeaways from the the, the collapse of ftx is that for all of the potential efficiencies and promise that the blockchain holds for us out there going forward um that you know um these entities and these technologies are still connected to the real world economy. And what brought down FTX wasn't a technological failure, it was a good old fashioned bank run and fraud and lack of regulation. So how do you, you know, these, but no matter how troubled the current or unmuddled the current situation is, these technologies that Paul is just talking about are there they need to be uh, factored into decision making and investments. So, how do you, how do, how do CEOs who grew up under this era of uh, of globalization that you have defined so well um, embrace these and embrace these in a smart way? Yeah, talent, 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 right? Inside and outside, um, there is no way to be that you can remote control this. You can't like say, okay, somebody please go off and then deliver to my office on Tuesday the, the solution. This has to be feathered in the strategy, the implementation if there is an implementation mode, the risk understanding, um, the population of the organization with the right skill sets. This has to be done um, almost like a pro it sounds terrible, but almost like a project, right? We live in a world today where people are maturing, technology is moving fast enough and people are maturing into the C-suite faster than they ever have before, the C-suite at large, not only the CEO. And we have to be, be sure, businesses, that they are prepared not only with the technical skills, what is blockchain, what is crypto, what is the metaverse, huh? but also with the soft skills, the software skills, what does risk look like? How do we manage a, a a diverse and integrated team? How do I grow a business? Those things have to come together. You said it very clearly and very interestingly, FTX failed for lots of different reasons. It wasn't because the cryptocurrency thing didn't work, right? It wasn't because they turned on the switch and it didn't do what it was supposed to do. It was literally because the structure around governing a business, the experience around governing a business, the risk understanding around governing a business, the talent needs of a business were not 
implemented in the right way. And I think that this is where we have businesses have to focus. It can't be on, oh my God, do I know what Meta is? Do I know it? It is literally, do I have the, do I have my management team, my leadership team, and the teams leading up to that team? Are they um, adequately diverse? Do they act? Do they have adequate access to different skill sets? Am I using this time to build my next generation of leaders that have both A and B? And this is, I think, one of the most important things. It takes a long time to become a problem. It takes a long time before you realize that you've messed up. But if you don't mess up and if you do it well, um, you will be a winner at the end of the day. You'll be significantly better prepared for some of the shifts that are happening in, in the industry. And that's what CEOs have to focus on, their talent pool broadly, not narrowly. Paul, can I ask you the same question? Because I know you take a, a great personal interest and talk quite a bit uh, about these um, these innovations that are going to be so such critical differentiators um, in you know in the years to come. Um, how you how you see this issue? Yeah, it's interesting on the particularly on the CEO investor delta. Um, uh, you know, as always, the responsibility lies in the C suite for navigating the right decision. Uh, and I do feel there's an element of sort of a Goldilocks uh, aspect here to investors' views. Uh, most CEOs will have borne the brunt of investor displeasure if there is a too sudden departure from their core strategy or their core capital allocation decisions or their core uh, model for financial returns to, to chase the opportunity of new technologies. And here we have some data suggesting that investors are you know, a little impatient for the level of investment behind some of these evolving technology. So any CEO and any CEO advisor should take this data, you know, apply some salt to understand, you know, whether it affects any difference of strategic approach. I, I would, however, say that, um, you know, the, the conversation around crypto has largely been devoid of all the things that are more important about crypto, which is the evolution of the digital finance system, the role of blockchain, and the opportunity for different use cases for that technology. We're continually chasing the up-down aspect of crypto, whether people are making money or whether people are losing money, and what's the size of the win or the loss from a net wealth perspective. And I would say if you did a review of all the acres of coverage, um, media and analyst and other in relation to cryptocurrency, it would largely be about, you know, I said the fortunes won and lost and the trading um, history around that. I think we're going to see a lot more, I think, realization because a lot of the crypto organizations are going to have to come close to the regulatory and financial centers. They're going to have to be part of a new financial paradigm, not separate from and a competing one. And then I think you may have a normalization of the regulatory and legislative environment, which will then lead to more you know, honest and sober conversations about, well, what does this mean? in terms of improving a company's ability to drive margin expansion or drive customer expansion. Ultimately, that's what businesses are in the business of doing. Um, and I think that's the, the fundamental shift we'll see in the digital finance front, just a, a maturing of what this means and what it needs. Similarly, perhaps on the metaverse um, and AI, most of the innovation and most of the, I think, work that's taken place has been done largely under private company uh, the rubric of private companies where they don't have the perhaps the stick of the investor market um, hanging over their head. So I think that will translate perhaps to you know those success points, those market expansion successes, those customer knowledge successes. And I think we're expected to see more M&A um, and more grafting of some of that technology uh, away from the VC market and perhaps into the more corporate boardroom. So more M&A on the metaverse technologies and AI and more normalization of the digital finance and the crypto environment from use cases away from the trading ups and downs. Yeah, at the end of the day, I take great comfort in this notion that even though these technologies can be scary, they're difficult to understand in many ways, but the reality of it is, is we've been there before, right? I mean, you look at even on crypto, I mean, just look at look at currency in this, in this country. We didn't have a unified paper currency in this country until the early part of the 20th century. We had thousands of different paper currencies out there issued by different banks. It was all a grand experiment. 
uh, until the Federal Reserve was essentially um, uh, established and took monopoly control over the printing of money. So we've seen these systems play out before, but now it's just happening in real time in front of everybody in an actually interestingly transparent way. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I want to turn to a really important issue. I know this is a big one for both of you, um, and, and it kind of closes out the report in many ways, and that's let's move on to ESG. Because, you know, as we've, as we've kind of talked about throughout this conversation thus far, the world is now facing a couple of major crises, uh, the role of democratic system in the, uh, in, in the global system, climate change, you know, these are at the, sort of the top of the list, and that really calls into question the role of the corporation in, in society. Um, and we have to remember that market capitalism, which is the foundation of this system, you know, um, is predicated on, on competition, right? Um, so a competitive profit-seeking entity, um, you know, is essentially an amoral one, even if it abides by law at, at, at all times. And so, you know, if you're incented, you're incented to be influential, but self-interested when it comes to making policy or comes, comes to influencing policy. Um, and if you do those things that are that are socially desirable, but are somehow less profitable, someone could come in and outcompete you. And yet, we have you know um, instituted now perhaps a new way of looking, getting away from the Milton Friedman concept of uh, of the corporation in a sense. And so, ESG, right? ESG has gone from being the absolute critical buzzword to now this highly politicized, even polarizing uh, polarizing concept. Um, where do you think we're going uh, on this, um, Ursula, both from a, and in, in, in the investor class, um, which is used as, A, as an opportunity to, to transfer, you know, and, and derive fees from massive uh, uh, movements of, of capital, um, to companies that, you know, I think a lot of CEOs not only want to check those ESG boxes, if you will, but also actually want to achieve the, the principles that are enshrined in the concept. Um, but it's becoming more complicated, no? Yeah, uh, it's becoming more complicated, yes. Not becoming more complicated, no. Um, but I do believe that um, we're at a point where there are some of unavoidables, at least um, the CEOs that we work with, almost to a person, understand that there are some unavoidables. One is an unavoidable on in the e in the e pay in the e space, which is we have to do something differently, and many are working together with governments um, across industry, definitely with investors to um, adjust the impact that commerce and the progression of the humans in this in our homes have on everything else in our homes, right on the earth. So I don't think that that's a debate anymore. When I was a CEO, it was definitely a debate whether you know climate change was really happening, whether we could actually do anything really about it. I think we've crossed that bridge now, and most companies, um, either publicly or behind the scenes, just about every company I'm working with, either publicly or behind the scenes, are working on an adjust an adjusted operating model to lower their impact, either of waste creation, energy utilization, um, how we treat our employees on a global basis, etc. So. There are some unavoidables that I think are very, very good, and that will that train is going to keep going. It, it's going to keep going, and I think that the people are going to be very more and more comfortable speaking about it, particularly as the governments and the investors ask questions about it. I think that there are some things that are jump balls still today. I think this idea of social equality, this idea of um, bettering the living standards or the lives or the access to opportunity of um, greater pieces of the population, that's still a debate, believe it or not. I was hoping that we would have been in a different place, but it is still um, not clear that, that that aligns well with capitalism. It's a strange way to put it, but that there is a, that there's a place that both of these things can actually sit. Many, many companies are voting to go the way of, yes, we have to do this. We have to be more inclusive. We have to be significantly broader. We have to lay, raise the level of of life, we have to be a broad, good ESG company, and they're moving down that way. But I think that the the ju the jury and the war made this clear. The jury is still out. When you're pushed hard, it's not clear where all of these companies will end up. Right, all countries will end up because some of the realities are very harsh. Right, you have a war where your source of energy is 
curtailed do you continue down the the path of being a, a strong ESG company or do you actually revert back to I'm going to use some coal I'm going to those kinds of things so, so I don't believe it's it's that clear right now I think we're still pushing through it I am very hopeful on the on the e part of ESG I'm not necessarily um, it's not clear yet whether or not we have a path forward that's that's um, that we can say is clear on the S and the G portion of the ESG journey. Yeah. So, Paul, on that point, I mean, it, it, it seems like the concepts uh, of, of each of the importance of each of these pillars that, that Ursula has just been talking about are accepted as as critically important and important to the to the to the social acceptance um, of the of the corporation. But but you know, is is what we've just gone through kind of let's call it ESG 1.0 in a sense, and that perhaps this disaggregation of this needs to to happen a little bit. I mean, I think in some ways you could use Elon Musk as a poster child, right? I mean, he's the poster child for E. Uh, Tesla is the is, is the um, representative company of a of a, of a of a of a green energy transition, but Elon on S and G is perhaps not as uh, much of a poster child. So. How do you see the evolution of this this really organizing concept? I think it's it's fascinating. I think corporations and the executives that run them have had a target on their back uh, with ESG. Um, most recently, obviously, and most acutely, the last number of years. My contention is, however, uh, if you think about even the American factory floor or office floor. My contention is they're the most evolved places in America from an ESG perspective. Um, it's where you can have differing opinions. You can have a different color of skin, different sexual preferences, different um, uh, religious views. And everyone is focused on how do you move the customer uh, experience forward? How do you serve, get your products and service to the market? How do you make sure that you get um, the next promotion? How do you drive the organization forward? And good leadership is aligned with that. It is completely ironic to me that the, the, the organism that is business has made most progress on E, S, and G, and it still bears all the brunt for uh, society's ills. I haven't met a CEO or a CFO or any of the C-suite who doesn't want to leave the world a better place from when they took office, uh, from a business perspective, from a society perspective, from an ES and G perspective, and as a genuine part of uh, their sense of legacy and their sense of purpose. And there isn't um, an office floor or manufacturing floor, I think in this country, I'm based here in New York in America, that all views, all shapes and sizes aren't largely embraced. Uh, and as a consequence of that, it is, largely frustrating for CEOs to understand that they're part of the solution every day. They're presented as the sole source of the problem. Uh, we're now at a stage where even your success in ESG is now going to be a point of contravention as to whether you're successful in your role as CEO. We've got the misuse of the English language where woke is now represented as both a, an issue that you're either for or against, leaving another, yet another issues for CEOs to try and navigate, where they're playing the role of politician, regulator, legislator, as well as business leader and innovator. And I think there's a, a breaking point on this system soon if I think the regulatory and legislative class don't catch up the successes in the C-suite and on those factory and office floors. So I think ESG um, is an area that I think the private market will improve the efficiency around standards. It'll improve the efficiency and efficacy around how companies respond, because that's what companies do. They evolve, they adapt, and they understand what consumers and customers need, which is progress on ES and G. So primarily, most of my confidence on the next chapter for the planet, and the next chapter for social justice, and the next chapter for fair governance of businesses and resources, I, most of my confidence lies in the C-suite and the CEOs, the men and women who are trying to grow a business and leave the world a better place. I think there's a lot of work to be done among all the other stakeholder groups, media, politicians, think tanks, industry groups, and the body politic broadly to actually catch up to where the corporate America is at. I think a real a reimagination and a realignment around 
you know, progress against ESG and who's affecting progress against that. And the depoliticization of some of this will be a key outcome um, that we'll strive to help companies with, you know, next year and beyond. But I think there's a realization coming soon that businesses are actually part of the solution, not part of the problem. Uh, and I think that day is coming. And that is a fine and, and thoughtful punctuation to our to our conversation today. Uh, thank you for that. The report, Paneo's Vision 2023, the CEO and Investor Global Survey, Where is the World Going in 2023 and Beyond, is out today, December 20th. If you uh, have not seen it, please reach out to us at Taneo Insights at Taneo.com or it can be available, seen, uh, seen and available on www.taneo.com. And so, uh, Ursula, I want to give you the last word and ask you one last question here. We've been talking about a world of, of, of amazing change. Uh, it's very, very unsettling, but it's also very exciting. So, you know, you were the CEO of a Fortune 100 company. Do you sit here today going like, God, I wish I was back in that seat again? Or do you think, so glad somebody else has got to, uh, to deal with all of that? Yeah, I definitely think this is an amazing time to be a business leader, amazing time to be a CEO. And if I were able to kind of roll back the clock from an age perspective, then I would absolutely want to jump right in there. I, this is an interesting time. This is a time where um, difference makes a difference. Having a, having a point of view makes a difference. Speaking up, Paul just talked about it. CEOs wake up in the morning and try to figure out a way fundamentally, generally, to make the world a better place by making their products the best that they can be and the services they deliver the best that they can be. And we have so many dials changing, turning right now, um, that people who actually are kind of run into it are, I think, better equipped and will be, will be very successful at um, leading their companies. And so this is a great time to be a business, a great time to be a CEO. Um, a little stressful, but great time. So I would, I would opt in. <laughs> if all, all else being equal, I would opt in. But all else is not equal. So no calls, please. <laughs> Ursula Burns. Thank you so much, Paul Carey. Thank you very much. Uh, and to our audience, thank you for joining today. As ever, we will be unpacking the issues that we've discussed today in greater detail on this program over the years to come. For now, I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York. Have a great day.